around here. Now we can get started. Poketo! Yofi! So we um, are getting ready for the Gula. The redemption is upon us. But just in case it's not completed by the weekend, you know, the temple has a discussion about the uh, first day of the um, second day of Pesach. One trip to Tel Aviv, it's very obvious we have not accomplished Gula yet. It could happen in a moment. The, Tal- the, the Talmud has a discussion. It says that <laughs> Yom Anef Kulo Asur, that say the day of waving of the Omer, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, after the destruction of the temple, he made a tak- takana, an enactment, which says you're not allowed to eat of the new fresh wheat mm-hmm. till the end of the day. Why? When there's no temple, it should be. There. Very quickly, maybe, the Beit HaMikdash will be built. And what's going to happen? People will say, well, last year, last year we ate at sunrise. So this year we're also going to eat at sunrise. And really, they're only allowed to at 9 or 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning when the, wave, when the offering was waved, the offering of the barley, the Omer offering. And so he made a takana only at the end of the day, just in case the Beit HaMikdash will be built quickly. From here we see that the Beit HaMikdash could happen and there are some Midrashim that say the Beit HaMikdash is going to fall from the sky. Have you ever heard this before? This is where it reminds me in Rav Moshe Kachan, she already, uh, in Rav Moshe he talks about Gula, how there was perspective that what the Moshiach is going to come, and Rav Moshe the air to Israel and the eagle. And, the, and you know what he said about this perspective? No. It's unrealistic, as we call it. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 you know what they say about the Zionists? No, 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 they did the opposite. They actually came and acted. They're, they're still idealists in a sense. When it comes to Eretz Israel, whoever is not an optimist is, uh, what do they say? That, uh, they don't, if you uh, don't believe in miracles, you're don't not believe realistic. in miracles, you're not a realist. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but they actually, his argument is about we act and then we get the silver bullet. We don't get right. the silver bullet. So, and then they so, He's absolutely right. I'm not arguing against Moshe Kaplan for, uh, for sure. The, the, the issue is that there are some sources which indicate that the uh, Hashem will be bringing us a, um, a, a Beit HaMikdash from on high, some kind of miraculous um, import from the heavens, because Yerushalayim, why is it uh, Yerushalayim? We have two Oznaim and two Einaim to Nechiraim. Aim means double Yadaim, Raglaim. We have pairs of everything. So when we say Yerushalayim, it makes sense that there's two Yerushalayim too. There's Yerushalayim down below. Yerushalayim down above. This is what some sources tell us. And that uh, perhaps, now how to make those two work together, it says in one place in the Talmud that. Hashem says, I'm not going to go enter the Yerushalayim up above unless my people enter Yerushalayim down below. So that's why we have to come to Mechon Meir, study Torah in Yerushalayim. If we want Hashem to, to re-enter his, his place for the Divine Presence. And even the next step, the next step is maybe that we build not only the city of Jerusalem, if we build the building of the Beit HaMikdash, then Hashem will take his Yerushalayim from above and make it enter the building of Beit HaMikdash of, of bricks and stones that we are going to build. And so it's sort of like a soul that comes into the body. I have one more question though. About only the Mizbeah has to be made off-site and not with tools. But the Beit HaMikdash itself, you can use something and you build on our body. But it's only the Mizbeah that has to be built off-site. Are you suggesting we also build the Beit HaMikdash off-site and eventually just... No, that's a nice idea though. It could be, it could be. Um, but um, we, we're, we're trying. There's a few obstacles. But we're trying to build a Beit HaMikdash. Quite a few obstacles. But in any case, there seems to be some part in the process that Hashem will play. And sure, 
the, I think the most simple way of understanding is, like I said before, you we build a structure, that's the body, and then Hashem will provide the soul. Hashem will bring Yerushalayim from above to enter Yerushalayim below. However, I'm not sure. Maybe Hashem will decide that time has come, the building's not there, the Jewish people have been lax, they've been not vigilant enough to demolish what's there. The reason that we don't have a temple... For whatever to... reason, it could be, well, for whatever reason, but Hashem says, I can't wait any longer. The time is... I've got to hasten the time because uh, Mashiach has to come now. So maybe He will give us a miracle. Mm. Hashem can do miracles. We've seen it before. So maybe the miracle will be that He will give us a Beit HaMikdash ready-made, for, and it'll come down from Shammai. There is such a tradition. I think that um, it's always important to remember what the Rambam writes at the end of the Book of Kings, where he discusses everything about the future days. And he gives, he says, everybody's trying to give their best interpretation of the writings, of the various prophecies that we have in the various books, and the various traditions. Even the rabbis of our sages were trying to give their best interpretation of these prophecies. But the bottom line is, in all these matters, lo neida ech sheyihiu ad sheyihiu. We do not know how they're going to come to pass until they come to pass. It's always uh, good to have a little bit of humility. I know that there are many Christian pastors around the world that think they've got it all worked out, study the book of Daniel, and I can tell you exactly this is going to happen, and then that's going to happen, and Armageddon this, and then that, and they're everything. They're stupid, they don't know what they're talking about. Unfortunately, there are some rabbis, too, who claim to have knowledge about the redemption has to come about in this way, X, and then Y, and then Z. I think we have to let Hashem surprise us. Definitely surprised us by giving such power to a man named Herzl, who didn't keep Shabbat to lead the, in gathering the exiles, we always envisioned it would be Mashiach, Ben David, a pious man, a holy man, teaching us Torah. And this, uh, the Jewish people are coming back to the land of Israel and building it, and the land is flourishing like ever before, even without the Jewish people, all keeping Shabbat and, and keeping kosher. So... Do we know exactly how it's going to happen? I can't tie the hands of Hashem. <coughs> he apparently wants it to start this way. In the end, we're promised that all will be good, all the Jewish people will return to Hashem, and everybody will, will be uh, faithful to our tradition. But exactly how it's going to happen? What's going to happen first? The Beit HaMikdash, Moshiach, in gathering the exiles, Tshuva, we don't know. We don't have a... At least I don't. <laughs> other, other people might claim to have a very clear roadmap, but I find that in our sources, we have not one roadmap, but two roadmaps and three roadmaps, many different options, how it's going to happen. In some places it says that very clearly that the Jewish people are going to come from the north, the northern countries, it's based on Pasuk, that, and then they're going to come and build the Beit HaMikdash in the south. Maybe it means the Europeans, who knows. The Europeans are going to come and build the Beit HaMikdash, and only then will Mashiach create a kingdom, a monarchy of the house of the Zion, of the house of David, will, will uh, declare his, his monarchy. So perhaps that's the way, the way it's going to happen. On the other hand, the Rambam writes, Mashiach is going to build the Beit HaMikdash. We have a few options. We have a few roadmaps. We don't know which one's right. You know who decides? Who paskins halacha? Rav Soloveitchik said, is there any psak halacha when it comes to matters of faith or matters of eschatology, which means the, uh, the Torah about what's going to happen in the future days? You know who paskins? Hashem paskin. Would we uh, uh, paskin that it's a good thing that there's a, uh, a state? I think we all realize that after the horrible Holocaust, it's an amazing thing that there's a state of Israel. The Jewish people have some protection, some, some uh, independence. It's unbelievable. It's been such a flourishing for the Jewish people never before. Have we had such success in history since the times of King Solomon? So 
we're going to tell God that he's wrong. God decided to bring it this way. We said thank you for all the blessings. Of course, we still have room to, to grow. We have what to progress, what to do. But I think it's, uh, this is my approach, that um, we're going to do our best to move forward towards the redemption. Keep the door open to be surprised. I think it's always a good idea. All right, yeah, you wanted to say something else? So the verse, the verse, so, um, you say not to keep uh, Shabbat. Not only that, but the chief uh, rabbi of Vienna condemned him because he, you know, had a Christmas tree in his uh, house on, on, during Christmas, and he also didn't circumcise his son, and he also said that he wanted all the Jews, at least in, in his area, to publicly convert to the gospel in this, you know, like a notable church, all these things. It was a... Uh, Listen, I believe that Herzl yeah, uh, was a human being, like all of us, and, and I also believe there were stages in his progression. At, at times, he was very connected to his, you know, traditional Jewish uh, upbringing. Yeah, yeah, there's some sources for that. I could send you to read uh, books. But the point is, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? It's a question of perspective. Of course, you can, you can probably look at my life and say, well, let's see what a sinner I am. Mm-hmm. Terrible the things that I did. Bad. Did he? No, no, no. He didn't. He that we Did he? <laughs> okay, I've made many That's crazy. Really I've I've made many many crazy suggestions in my life, and even I've done done some of them. <laughs> but does that mean that I get judged only by my worst moments, or do I just do I get judged by my best moments? So it's a question of perspective, and I think in the larger perspective, he played a role, whether we like it or not. He played a central role in bringing the Jewish people back to the land of Israel and establishing a Jewish state, which is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. It's not uh, the ideal, it's not perfect, but uh, many mitzvot that I do are not perfect. Sometimes I don't have kavanah for every word of my Shemona Asri. Do you? Every word? Do you ever, do you ever lose your attention for a few moments? Do you, ever, do you ever not pay attention when you're saying a bracha? Did you ever speak Lashon Hara? Did you ever, spe- did you ever make a mistake with your speech? Okay, you, you have a, a clear yardstick. Um, <laughs> things that you do or things that you wanted to do. I, I think... Uh, you ate pork uh, like a few times in this. It's not fine, it's horrible. No, not fine. It's not fine, it's horrible. It. It's horrible, but you can prove from it. Same. And you can improve once that once you suggest somebody convert to Catholicism, that's it. There's no tshuva. Did, Are you did, closing did the door? Tshuva? Tshuva? You can't do tshuva, did you? You know that he didn't. You I know that what he did. thought on his deathbed. You know that he was happy about everything that he did in his life. We can assume that he did tshuva. The point, though, is not to discuss whether or not Herzl gets front row seats in heaven. Or he, he's all the way back in the bleachers, or he's down there somewhere else. That doesn't matter. The that, point that is... We don't, we don't have that. The Christians have that notion. Well, there's such a concept as purgatory, even in our tradition. Yeah, but the point is, the point is um, I'm not here to be the judge. There's only one judge. Uh, well, from my perspective, I, I don't care, really, how Herzl is going to be judged. How many degrees of the fire was turned to. 350, 250, 180. I don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is to me is, what does Hashem want from me? What does Hashem want me to do? And, and uh, when I see what Hashem is doing in history and how he used this fellow to push the Jewish people ahead towards the land of Israel, ultimately that's, that's a big, uh, that's something that we should celebrate. Something that he should be you should be appreciated for. Uh, it's not for me to to uh, make the, be be the judge uh, in the final, you know, verdict of of his situation. But uh, again, getting back to our concept, we were talking about Mashiach bringing the Beit Hamikdash first. Afterwards, maybe maybe his greatest fault will be that he brought the Jewish people to Israel, but he didn't start building the Beit Hamikdash. Yeah. Maybe that would have been better. With the Beit Hamikdash being rebuilt, so. Oh, okay. Maybe there's some redeeming uh, quality. Yeah, there's something interesting. In the morning, every day we we uh, after the, at the end of the praying, we have uh, the special chants for every day. Mm. 
Each day. Each day. Right. So the song of the day. On Wednesday we have Psalm 94. Okay. Is that interesting when we read this? Yes. Um, so please for me to give the, the correct translation. But it's something uh, because you're talking about judging, looking for other people. Yeah. What we do, and sometimes we say, oh, we can do this. No one will know if no okay. one will see. And it's written inside. Uh, Hashem who create uh, uh, the eyes, the ears, and everything. Right. Do you think when he was the creator of everything, he don't know what is going on, what is happening, what you're saying, what you're thinking, what you see, everything, and so we need to be careful about things, to judge other people, and uh, it's, I, I love this so much, and <laughs> of course every week we read the same, but even then it's like reading Torah, every time when we read, we read something new, even when we read it before so many times, it's it's amazing. It's beautiful. I love it so much. It is beautiful. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you for mentioning it. We are going to uh, finish up the laws of Tisha B'Av. Mm-hmm. Uh, the days are upon us. We have today and tomorrow. We're going to start today uh, about the order of the prayers. Page 208. We read Eicha. It's uh, chapter 10 in the Laws of Tisha B'Av in the Book of Zmanim by Rav Malai Malamed. Uh, section 15, it says, Reading Eicha and dimming the light. We read Eicha after praying Mariv. According to Ashkenazi, we recite a bracha over reading of Eicha, as it is explained in Sofrim. 14.3, they recite brachot over the reading of all Megillot. Others rule that we only recite a bracha when the Megillah is written on parchment, like a Torah school. If it's not written on parchment, we do not recite a bracha when we read it. Conversely, still others rule that even when a Megillah is written on parchment, we do not recite a bracha when we read it, since this bracha is not mentioned in the Talmud. So we have all three opinions. Yeah. We recite a bracha without the parchment, we recite a bracha with the parchment, and we don't recite a bracha either with the parchment or with a, with a, uh, with a, a book. Many wrote and ruled this way because of the uncertainty in the matter. When you're uncertain, page 208. It's 208. Um, <coughs> when there's a matter of doubt, usually we, we opt to, uh, to not say the bracha because uh, you don't want to be saying God's name in vain. In practice, al Sfaradim and many Ashkenazim, including all Hasidim, read Eicha without reciting a bracha. While some Ashkenazim, especially those who follow the Vilna Gaon's practice, read it from a kosher parchment scroll and recite a bracha. There's a fellow in my community. He's very careful about this. He has a parchment. I believe it belongs to the community, but he's the, known as the reader. Is that and special, uh, I forgot, Balaam? Balaam? No, no, it's, it's a regular parchment. It's not the, the uh, Yemenite what, type. What is, the, what is this regular parchment you speak of? Um... There's different parts of the skin. There's the, 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 the side that's closer to the hair. There's the inside. Cow? Yeah, it's, it's all. Uh, or, or goat. Yeah, either one. Either one. It's usually, uh, it usually comes from, uh, believe it or not, uh, fetuses. Very soft skin. Um, and they, anyways, the, it's, it's, it's a little bit unique. Most communities don't have special Megillot, scrolls, written, right? Esther, Ruth, Eicha, Kohelet, and Shir Shirin, the five scrolls. Some communities have them. The Gra said it's a mitzvah to have these written down on parchment. And if you have them written down on parchment, then you should cite a bracha. So my community, the rabbi there, he recites a bracha on reading the Megillah Techa. Although most communities, no bracha, no bracha. Just because it's a matter of doubt, we don't. Most communities don't have a scroll. There's only the Torah scroll, not the scroll of the Megillot, of the five uh, scrolls. Do we have here? Here in Machon, I I don't know. I think so. I think so. It makes it a little bit harder for the reader because if you have it written on parchment, like I say for Torah, there's no there's no nekudot. There's no dot and there's no ta'amim, there's no uh, cantillation notes. And so you have to have it all memorized. Yeah, so the reader has to be, he has to really be prepared. 
But uh, okay, we do that every week for the Sefer Torah. Why not do it for Eicha? Um, if you have that uh, ability to have a scroll. In any case, I don't know what they do upstairs. Pay attention. You'll see. You'll hear. Is he making a bracha or not making a bracha? Unless Mashiach comes first. Okay, it is customary. Top of page 209. Good morning, Israel. We're on the top of page 209 right now. We're preparing so that you don't get surprised when, when Tisha B'Av comes, what the special unique practices of the day are. So right after Mariv, we do we recite a bracha or not on the reading of Echa? You can if you want to, but it has to be a specific scroll. It's different customs. I wouldn't say you can if you want to. I said that if you have that custom, if you no, are no, following no. the Vilna Gaon practices and you have a parchment, then, then there are some communities that do that. But most communities don't say a bracha. It's customary. And this is a tricky because nowadays we have electricity. It is customary to darken the synagogue on the night of Tisha B'Av. As it says, he made me dwell in darkness. It's from the book of Eicha, which we're going to be reading. Midrash similarly states that God said to the ministering angels at the time of the destruction of the temple, what does a human king do when he is mourning? They replied, he extinguishes the lamps. God said to them, I will do the same. As it says, the sun and the moon are darkened. We're going to look at the kinot soon. The first kina, after we read Tisha B'Av, we also read these poems. They're called kinot. And one of them talks about how the nature I think it's called, um, there's a word for it in literature, where nature expresses our feelings. It's like when we're feeling sad and mourning, so the sun and the moon are darkened, are blackened out. So, of course, we're, uh, how do you do that? In some synagogues, they turn off half the lights, because you still want to read, you still want to be able to see. Some people nowadays have a flashlight in their pocket. Do you have a flashlight in your pocket? Do you have a flashlight in your pocket? You have a flashlight in your pocket? Of course, every phone nowadays. Mm-hmm. Everybody has a phone in their pocket. And it all has a flashlight in it. So they really can turn out all the lights and everybody... Can you imagine that? <clears throat> Very special. To be in the dark. Everybody with their own little flashlight. Not only that, where are they? Sitting on the floor. Mm-hmm. We're going to get to that in just a minute. But we also know, also in darkness, there's light. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely. And you're not referring to the flashlights. <laughs> Already at the beginning of the night, we turn off some of the lights in the synagogue. It's proper to do the same at home. The main things to be meticulous about is to dim the lights for the reading of Eicha, because that is when it's customary to blow out all the candles in the room, except for a few that are needed for reading Eicha. Now that we use electric lights, some turn off all the lights for the reading. Produce necessary light with candles alone. Others keep a few electric lights on. The institution to read Eicha with the congregation, primarily related to reading it at night, as it says in Eicha, Bitterly she weeps in the night. Vachotiv ke balayla. It's the second pasuk in Eicha. However, many people have accustomed to read it again during the day after reciting Kinot in a place where congregation does not read Eicha publicly during the day. It's proper for each individual to read it by himself. Many people do not know that, do not do that. In the morning we're busy with the Kinot, with the special other poems, but it's a good idea to reread Eicha after hearing it at night. You reread it in the morning, but just by yourself. You can read it in English. You can uh, study it. Okay, so um, he didn't mention the sitting on the, on the ground because we said earlier that we're sitting on the ground. But for sure, even people who have a bad back or people who uh, really have a hard time, and they're not going to sit on the low chair all day long. For the few moments of reading of Eicha, it's quite uh, common that this is uh, it's part of the way we express our morning so we at, at the most intense. Yeah, in between, in between, yeah. Yeah, you, you just manage. You can just sit where your feet usually are and just sit there. Don't old school Middle On your Eastern, tuchus. Don't old school Middle Eastern Jewish Batei Knesset have, they just have cushions instead of, like, some of them have cushions right. instead of, like, is he around there to sit on the bottom? Yeah, you're right. You're right. For them, it wouldn't be such a big dis- change to sit on the floor. Do you have to push beneath you? Do you have to sit the gamma on the floor? Yeah, we covered all this yesterday. Um, that there are there are um, allowances. Some people say a tefach off the ground. Some people say three tefachim off the ground. Some people say even if it's higher than three tefachim, as long as it's lower than a regular chair. 
And some people say you should uh, be careful not to sit directly on the earth. Some people say if there's tiles, it's good enough. Some people say you should always have some kind of a cloth separating you. So we covered all that yesterday. Um, but that was a nice brief summary. There are many different opinions. The standard is three tfachim. But if you sit on the ground or on a lower chair, just the usual chair, what, uh, what does it mean? It's not the end of the world. It's just, um, you know, you're not following the practice of mourning. Uh, you, you are, if you're fasting, so you're doing some of the practices of, of the Tisha B'Av, but not all of them. You know. I, I, I'm just thinking, uh, when we think about very old people, it's hard, too hard for them. They'll sit on a regular chair. They can't get up. They can't get down. That's the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If somebody's sick or infirm, for sure they, they can be lenient about this. It's not a biblical mitzvah. It's not even a rabbinic mitzvah. It's, a, it's the practice of, of the standard practice. But if somebody's a unique situation, that's why uh, you heard it was a question earlier before. Somebody wanted a heter, a heter, a permission to shave. He's saying he's not sleeping well during the nine days, so I want to look it up. But I'm pretty sure that that's an exceptional situation if it's stopping your sleep. And you're not, yeah, that's considered to be illness, so the regular rules don't apply. There's always, but I want to d- double check before I give him an answer. Um, so we always, uh, that's the beauty, beauty of halakha, that it's so flexible. There's a lot of rules, a lot of standards, but you have to know that the, the exceptions are there for the exceptional cases. And, Exceptional cases are common. What about women? <laughs> you got the joke. Sorry? What about? What about women? Women also. They should be sitting on the floor too, especially for the reading of Eicha. But um, many women come to the synagogue to listen to Eicha, to participate in the morning of the community. And uh, they have a women's section. They can sit on the floor in the women's section. It's the what same. about children? Yeah. Also, the children love it. The children are sitting on the floor all day long. <laughs> for them, it's easy. And for them, it's exciting. Oh, the parents are down on the, on the carpet together with them now. It's, so uh, it's almost fun. But, uh, of course, we're teaching the children. It's, uh, children are not obligated themselves until they become bar mitzvah. But until then, we, we try to teach them. And they, it should be part of their experiences of growing up. They, uh, until we have happier times, that they should know that we have national mourning. If we take it seriously, and we sit on the floor. All right? Yeah. Um, so I hear that there is a range, maybe because I'm not close or something, of the measurement of tefah. It's one, one measurement is 8 centimeters, or what is the other? Measurement? Correct. That's the, that's the primary one you should know. That's the, uh, the closest we have to uh, a standard, 8 centimeters for a tefah, a hand breadth. Um, the Chazanish had a, a, a larger measure for all the measurements of Torah, but... Um, when push comes to shove, there are actually there are testimonies that he himself was lenient with a smaller shear, and um, we try, if we can, in some instances, if it's a biblical mitzvah, to go with a higher measure. But uh, by all means, I don't think that's the standard uh, opinion. And uh, so, if it's a biblical mitzvah, Mr. Burra says we should try to be machmir and go with the higher measure. But for everything else, now we're just talking about a you know, rabbinic uh, mitzvah. For sure you can... In this case, it's the opposite. The smaller measure is actually a bigger chumrah. Because it means you can... Right? If you're going to measure how far you can go from the, from the floor, the smaller measure means you have to be closer to the floor. So that's harder. So this way it works out as a chumrah. So if you want to go to Chazanish Lekula, usually he didn't... He, he didn't Lekula is, is for leniency. Right. The kula and the chumra, the kula, the kula, kal, light, to be light, to be lenient, as the chumra, which is to be more stringent, to be. Somewhere, to be more stringent. That's right. Eight, seven, eight, uh, ten point two centimeters, eight, ten point two. Correct. Yeah, I think it's. I can't remember what the Chazanish's uh, measurement is precisely. But eight centimeters is most accurate universally. Yeah. Most yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. Page two hundred and ten. Yes. When we okay after the Shabbat, after the Shabbat, uh, we need to go back and change our floor. Then that's right. To, to observe this. That's, that's right. right. Usually, we don't want to be coming to the Eicha, which is morning time, when our Shabbat finest. Mm-hmm. The way most communities work it, 
and this is suggested by many poskim, uh, nowadays it's becoming standard almost. It doesn't happen so often that Tisha B'Av comes on a Shabbat or Saturday night, but it does happen. Because either if Tisha B'Av falls out either on Sunday or on Saturday, it's the same rule. So we have two out of seven chances. So the chances it's going to happen is more often. In any case, when it does happen, what we do is we... Um, it's a little bit tricky, but so pay attention here. I'll write it down on the board. On a regular Saturday night, you uh, you finish Suda Shlishit. So Seuda, what does that mean? Shlishit. Right, the third meal. You finish the Suda Shlishit. You say Birkat Amazon. And then you go to Arvit. You're still wearing your Shabbat clothes. And then when Arvit starts, in the Arvit, you say, you add in a special prayer. What do you add in to the Arvit of Motzei Shabbat? The, 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 the right. You have graced us with wisdom. It's an addition into the fourth blessing of the Amida, which basically is a form of Havdalah. It's a form of Havdalah, where you make the distinction between how to uh, make until you make Havdalah. Some a woman who doesn't dive in Arvit, most women don't dive in Arvit. There's another option, and that is Baruch Hamavdil. That's the five words. Bain Kodesh Le Chol. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. Five words. This is another form of Havdalah, not inside the Arvit, but outside the Arvit. You could just say it sitting in, uh, at the end of Sudash Tishit, you can say it. As soon as it gets dark enough, as soon as the three stars come out, you can make this type of Havdalah, and then you can do work. Again, Havdalah with a cup of wine, you only do later, and then you're allowed to eat and drink. Okay? That's a regular Shabbat. What's going to happen this year, this year, usually on the eve of Tisha B'Av, we have a special morning meal. We don't have that this year. We sit on the ground for the morning meal. We have an egg. We have round foods. We have only one dish. We don't do that this year. We just have Sudash Nishit. So this year, as is usual, you have the Suda Shlishi. The only thing is, you have to finish before the fast starts. Over here, usually it's not so significant, you know, when you finish Suda Shlishi. You just have to finish in time to get to Arvit. But this week, you have to finish before... Sunset. Sunset in Hebrew is? Shkia. Shkia. Okay, you must finish before sunset because then you're not allowed to eat anymore. So you look at the clock or you look at the outside the window. You see the sun setting. You say, okay, tell your family, no more eating from this, this week. It's approximately 7.30. But it's not time for... Arvit yet. Three stars don't come out for another 35 minutes. So if, if, if Shkia is 733, Arvit is going to be not till 8. Right, this is 733. And this is going to be around 810. So what do you do in between? So you can sing songs. You can sing the songs of Suda Shlishit. You can do Birkat Amazon. But no more eating and drinking. So you're still in your Shabbat clothes. And you're singing. But you're also fasting. 
Usually, what you should do is sing about Yerushalayim. You sort of, it's a transitional period until Shabbat ends. What happens when Shabbat ends? Usually we daven alvit right away. This time, before we daven alvit, we need to do something else. So we push alvit later. We make most synagogues, alvit is not going to be at 10 after 8, but it's going to be at 8.30. Why? What do you have to do between 10 after 8 and 8.30? Good. First you say, Baruch HaMavdil ben Kodesh Lachol. At 8.10 you say, Baruch HaMavdil ben Kodesh Lachol. Take off your clothes. You can turn the lights on, turn the lights off. You said the Havdalah. And put on your weekday clothes. Take off your shoes. And put on your uh, non-leather shoes or slippers as we discussed yesterday. And then you go to Bet Knesset, what about Havdalah? On the wine. This week, there's no Havdalah on the wine. Only thing there is, what's left of Havdalah? The fire. The fire, the fire. We, some people do the fire at home, at 10 after 8, sometimes in shul, before they start uh, Alvit. Over here, at 8.30, they also, we have the reading of Eicha, and a few keynote, five keynote. And uh, before, some people here uh, make the bracha on the fire. Okay, is that clear what we do? You can make the bracha on the fire over here too. As soon as you say, Baruch HaMavdil Ben Kodesh Lachol, like this week, we're not saying the Arvit with the Tacharantanu until later. Okay? So this week is a little different than usual. So we push, most communities, they push off the Arvit so that you can change your clothes, say Baruch HaMavdil, change your clothes, and uh, get ready. Bring your book of Eicha. Many synagogues don't have their own. You have to bring it with, and your book of Kinot, and come to shul, and then by that time you already have to be sitting on the floor. You should be sitting on the floor from after Shabbat. You should not really be st- sitting on a regular chair, sitting low, and then when you come to Arvit, you should be sitting on the floor. Some people will say, I'm only going to start sitting on the low, low, low bench when I get to Eicha, not for Arvit. It's not really correct. Ideally, it should be uh, the entire, uh, entire Tisha B'Av, up until Chatzot, we are not allowed to sit on a high chair, on a regular chair. So that applies, that starts already here at 8.10. The really, Tisha B'Av starts here. We're machmer to stop eating by Shkia, by sunset, because of that twilight zone between day and night. There's a debate when the day starts. So for food and drink, we're machmer, and so we have to finish the food before sunset. But in terms of all the other things, changing our clothes and sitting on a low stool, it's only after the, uh, the stars come out which is this year, about 10 after 8. Is that clear? Excellent. Okay, now, into our prayers, like every week, we're going to add the Atachon Antanu. Even though we've said Baruch HaMavdil, you can still say Atachon Antanu. There's something else that we have to add. In the Arvit, we add, if you're Sfaradi, you add a special prayer called Aneinu. Aneinu is said on fast days. The Ashkenazim only add the Aneinu at Mincha time, the following day. The, What's about the time when we say the Shlichot? We also add the There's no Shlichot on, on, uh, on Tisha B'Av. Yeah. There's no Shlichot on Tisha B'Av. There's Kinot, it's something else. This is a different Aneinu. The one in Slichot is different than this one. This one is a, it's in your Amidah prayer in the Shomea Tfilah section. But that's on every fast day. On this fast day, we also have an additional insert. It's called Nachem. 
Nachem is an insert into the bracha about Yerushalayim. Console Jerusalem. So the Sephardim, right away in Arvit, they add in Aneinu and Nachem. Ashkenazim only do it the following day at Mincha. The Chazan does it earlier, but that's uh, leave that for the Chazanim. Uh, Aneinu and Nachem, so we have quite a few changes to our Arvit. We add one edition is Atachon Antanu, second edition is Aneinu, and the third edition is Nachem. That, and then we add Eicha and Kinot. That's, if, that's for Sephardi Jews. This said number two and number three uh, only apply for, for the following day at Mincha. So, let's see it inside. This is a fascinating topic. There is a debate about the text of the Nachem prayer. Let's see it inside. Page 210. Michael, read for us, please. 210. <laughs> As we learned according to Sefan the custom, one should recite a nail when the silent Amida throughout the fast. Therefore, on Tisha B'Av, which begins at night, one should recite it at it at Ma'ariv Shacharit and Mincha. According to Ashkenazi custom, however, the only recited prayer in which it is re- recited is Mincha. The sages instituted that one should add the Nachem prayer to the Beracha of Bone, Yerushalayim, in the Amida, whenever Aneinu is recited. The conclusion of this Beracha is changed as well, becoming Menachem. Menachem. That's me. Yes. Sion Befinian, Yerushalayim. Mukom Prot Sion, Zion, with the rebuilding of Jerusalem. This is for the question. Or Menachem Sion, who Bone Yerushalayim, who comfort Zion and rebuild Jerusalem, Ashkenazi and North African version. The text of Nachem contains phrases that seemingly do not apply to modern day Jerusalem, like the city that behaves for the loss of its children, desolate with her inhabitants. She sits with her head covered like a barren, childless woman. Legions have deformed her, idolaters have taken possession of her. However, it's difficult for us to change the formulation that the sages instituted. In addition, unfortunately, this language can still apply to the Temple Mount. Furthermore, compared to what Jerusalem should be, the capital of the world, perfect in beauty, joy, all the earth. It's indeed considered destroyed and desolate. What okay, so stop there for a second. Everybody open up a Sidur. There's a, on the, behind you, there's Sidurim, this blue Sidur. You can all look at the same page. I want you to turn to the Mincha prayer. The Mincha prayer appears here in the Sidur. So you could just see what we're talking about. Page 290. 292. 292. The usual prayer for rebuilding Jerusalem ends with the words, Blessed are you, Lord, who builds Jerusalem. Bone Yerushalayim, page 292. As you can see, right after the prayer for rebuilding Jerusalem, there's two lines. And in between the two lines, it says, On Tisha B'Av, all conclude as follows. Nachem, console, O Lord, our God, the mourners of Zion and the mourners of Jerusalem, and the city that is in sorrow, laid waste, scorned, and desolate. Hirsch, will you read it for us? That grieves for the loss of its children. <laughs> ah, in English, please. Yes, yes. Ah, ah. Console, O Lord our God, the mourners of Zion and the mourners of Yerushalayim, and the city that is in sorrow, laid waste, scorned, and desolate, and grieves for the Too loss small. of its children, that is laid waste of its dwellings, robbed of its glory, desolate, God, and have Sits with a white covered and barren, childless woman, legions have devoured her, idolaters have taken possession of her, they have put 
your people is Israel, the sword and deliberately killed the devoted followers of the Most High. Therefore, Sion weeps bitterly, and Yerushalayim raises her voice. My heart, my heart grieves for those they killed. I am in anguish. I am in anguish for those they killed. For you, O Lord, consumed it with fire, and fire you will rebuild it in the future, as I said. And I myself will, will be a wall of fire around it, says the Lord, and it will be a glory within. Blessed are you, Lord, to consult the Lord and rebuild the Yerushalayim. Yeah, I mean, so you could see a few differences here. Number one, it's a very long passage to add. Number two, the ending. How does the usual bracha end? Baruch Atah Hashem. Bonei Yerushalayim. We rebuild Jerusalem. What do we say now? Blessed are you, Lord, who consoles Zion and rebuilds Jerusalem. So we add in this idea of consolation. Bonei Yerushalayim. That's why that's the beginning. The first word of the prayer is Nachem. Nachem means console. Console. What's the man? The morning. They put the man before. Why is it not? In my name, Menachem Tzion. It's it's about him, it, he. It's it's uh, it's a, attributing consolation to him. It's it's a verb. Somebody who's Menachem. It's like Medaber. It's the PL form in the Hebrew. It gets the the mem at the beginning, right? Medaber, Mezamel, Menagen. It's the PL form. You have a mem at the beginning. So Menachem. The actual word is Nachem, but the mem comes from the conjugation. Of the the verb form, you'll you'll study in the opan. You'll figure it out one one day. So Menachem Tziot, God consoles Zion. So we add that in. We change one of the endings of the nineteen blessings, right? The one about Jerusalem. Now, as you can see, Hirsch read for you. There's not only a description of the destruction of the temple. There's a description of the city of Jerusalem. It grieves for her. She's like a barren, childless woman. Is Jerusalem today childless? Not quite. Not quite. It's the biggest population in the entire state of Israel. There's more Jews in Jerusalem than there are in Tel Aviv or Haifa or Ashdod by far. So how can we say that Jerusalem is desolate? This is our prayers. So some rabbi said, we have to change the wording of the prayer. And changing is very difficult in, in the conservative world, a small c conservative world. But it doesn't take much. You just change it from the present tense to the past tense. We're still praying for Jerusalem to be rebuilt because the temple is not rebuilt. And all we have to do to make it, we have to say truth. We can't speak lies in our prayers. So we change it to the past tense. She was desolate from her children. And she was mourning a barren, childless woman. Some people said, there's many different versions. Some people want to change it and take that part out. Just leave the part that talks about Jerusalem crying, not for her children, but crying for her ramparts, for her, for her towers, for meeting the Beit HaMikdash. Mm-hmm. So, Rabbi Melamed, as we saw, he says, we don't have the power to change the prayers. He's not in favor of changing it. He says, just in your mind. What we do is we interpret. We don't change the, the language. We just think about that we're not, we're not really meaning that Jerusalem is empty and desolate with no children. But we mean the Beit HaMikdash is empty. And it's true that where children are not, uh, very few people go up to the Beit HaMikdash, to the Temple Mount. One other point I'd like to show you here is that what we were talking about earlier. Where does the tradition come from that the Beit HaMikdash is going to come from the heavens already built and come down to us from this verse? It says, I myself will be like a wall of fire around it, says the Lord. This sounds like you. It says, with fire you will build it in the future. So this is based on the tradition that God is going to build the Beit HaMikdash. And make it maybe make a wall, a fire around it to protect it. So there is this strain of tradition that uh, Hashem will will show us miracles in the building of the temple. And um, again, it can be interpreted one way or the other. It could say He's going to bring the Beit Hamikdash from above to give the spirit to the Beit HaMikdash that we build out of our own stones and and, uh, cranes and and, uh, 
uh, carriers and so forth. But um, this is the prayer Nachem which gets added in. I'd like you now, any questions on Nachem prayer? The Ashkenazim only added in at Mincha time. The Sephardim added all three prayers. And they changed the, the blessing about Jerusalem to Menachem Tzion, O Bunei Yerushalayim. Now we go, turn one more page, just one page, to the next page, page 294. Go to page 295, it's in the, 294, in the Mincha service. 294. Hershey, got it? 294. Very nice. Michael, page 294. In the Sidur. In the Sidur. As you can see, it's the Shema Kuleinu prayer. Listen to our voice, Lord our God. Spare us and have compassion on us. In compassion and favor, accept our prayer. For you, God, listen to our prayers and please do not turn away. O oh, our King, empty handed from your presence. Now there's a star. That star is very important. That is where you should, every day, insert private prayers in your own language. That's where you're allowed to insert anything you want into your prayers. If you want to pray because your mother is sick or your business yeah. is we'll at this point very good excellent great not everybody not knows this word. nobody ever, not everybody knows it every sidur is a little different this sidur doesn't say that this sidur if you look at the star it only mentions the addition for the fast days look in between the lines on page 294 it says on this point at fast days the congregation ends Answer us, Aneinu. This is a different Aneinu than in the Slichot. You see, uh, Ravid, Aneinu, answer us. Um, uh, Stephen, will you read for us? Answer us, Lord. Answer us, Lord. Answer us on our fast day, for we are great distressed. We are in great distress. Look not at our weakness. Do not hide your face from us, and do not ignore our plea. Be near to our Christ. Please let your loving kindness comfort us. Even before we call to you, answer us as he said. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. For you, Lord, are the one who answers the time of distress. Redeem and rescue all time trouble and anguish. Yafe. So this is added on the fast days if you're fasting. So the uh, Ravid was showing me. You can also look on, uh, at Rafainu. Rafainu is prayers for healing. There's an addition on page 288. That's what you have, what you were showing me. Yes. But there's another option to pray for. Let's say you don't want healing. You want somebody to get married. You want somebody to uh, to win a million dollars. You want somebody to uh, to uh, have success. You pray for them here in the Shomei Tfilah. That's not mentioned here. I just want to show you where, in the, if you go to the Mincha prayer, because this is an Ashkenazi Sidur, of course, you will find in the Mincha, this is the extra prayer that we're talking about on fast days, and this is the extra prayer we're talking about on uh, Tisha B'Av, about Jerusalem. Okay? So we have these two additions in the Mincha prayer. Of course, at this point, in the, in the uh, Shomea Tefillah, Bracha, you can add in other things as well. That's what I was teaching you. Thank you so much. No problem. Is that clear? Yes. Is that clear? Yeah? Israel, do you know where to add a prayer? You want me to show you in your, yeah. in your, in your Siddur? Yeah. So let's take a look. Shalom, shalom. Um, here, where you have this section... This is for if you want to uh, ask for forgiveness. But this section is on a fast day. Oh, okay. Now, right, right. Now, if you look early, even earlier, well, they don't have it here, maybe they have it at Mincha. And Mincha, we have an additional one. Not only does it have Anenu, which is the same, oh. answer us, this is the same. There's also one more uh, over here. Mm. This one. This is on the ninth of Av. We add in the Yerushalayim section of Mincha. Okay? 
All right, there's also the, so you're able to insert, how many blessings are there in the Yamida? 19. 19. How many were there originally? 18. 18. And these, bracha, this, this text, so ancient and so holy, goes all the way back to the Second Temple times, over 2,000 years. Sometimes we make changes. On Tisha B'Av, some of us, almost all of us, will be making changes and additions to three out of the 19 blessings. Which three blessings? It's quite common. Turn, please, to page 288. 288 in your blue Sidur. Page 288 in the blue Sidur. It's the bracha of Rafainu. Many people have the custom to pray for a sick person in the blessing of healing. You have a whole list. Amazing. You do that in where at this point? I do it in the first Amidah I do the day. Okay. In this, in this section, in the refuah, in the healing section. Yeah. yeah. As you can see, it's in the Sidur. So that's one insert. But if you turn two pages, when you get on Tisha B'Av, on page 292, we have an insert to the blessing about Jerusalem. That's what I just ta- taught you. It's called Nachem. And if you turn one more page, you get a third insert in the bracha of Shema Kuleinu, response to prayer on page 294. And I was just, just telling you that you're also able to add in prayers for anything you want in the Shomer Tfilah prayer. So three out of the 19 blessings have an insertion, an insertion on this day if you, if you choose to add a prayer for somebody sick. You don't have to. But uh, you could also insert it in the Shomer Tefillah. There's two options. You can insert each thing you ask for in the blessing that discusses that issue, like healing. So you'll put in a request for somebody who's sick during that blessing. Or the Shomer Tefillah is a catch-all. You can ask for anything you want, whether it has to do with wisdom, you're studying for a test, you could pray for it in the bracha about wisdom, or you could pray for it in the bracha of Shema Kuleinu, the, that is the catch-all, answering all of our prayers about everything. And that's when we have a fast day, we make that standard insertion for the fast day is in the Shomer Tfilah section. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand you good. In the section of the healing, uh, yes. we also can add other things? No. Only about healing. Only about hearing. It's in the Shomea section about hearing our prayer. Mm-hmm. There you can add in anything you want okay. about other things other than healing. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yafe. Okay, let's keep going. We're on page 210 of the Zmanim section now. We'll open up the Zmanim books for those who came late. We talked about. Uh, it's a, it's a unique thing that uh, the Tisha B'Av, although it's a fast day and we're mourning, we do not recite Tachnun, bottom page 210. Mm-hmm. We do not recite Tachnun on Tisha B'Av or at the Mincha of the eve of Tisha B'Av because Tisha B'Av is also called a Moed. A Moed is a festival. As it says in Eicha, the first chapter, he has proclaimed a set time against me. The word Moed means a set time, but it also means holiday. In other words, if we are worthy, it will be a holiday. So there is the potential for redemption in this day. Potential for a festival. So we don't recite the Tachanun, which is the more morose, more sad, uh, or, or somber part of the service. Mm-hmm. We skip it. Very, very uh, unique. Even when we're in the, uh, in the depth of our mourning, we always have hope. We always have hope. Where the Kohanim recite Birkat Kohanim daily at Shacharit, the custom of some congregations is that they do not do so on Tisha B'Av. Page 211. As it says, when you lift up your hands, I will turn my eyes away from you. Mm. Who lifts up their hands? The Kohanim. So Hashem is not going to look at them. So it's sort of like uh, not the proper time for giving a bracha. 
This is similar to the Allah that a Kohen is mourning does not recite Birkat Kohenim because he is forlorn and for unable to blast the congregants with peace. We mentioned that the bracha of the Kohenim is that he is blessing the people in peace. If he's not at peace, how can he give them that blessing? So Moshe, Ashkenazim, and Sephardim follow this custom and some communities where Birkat Kohenim is generally uh, recited, the Kohenim do recite it at Shachrit and Tisha B'Av. And the Kabbalists of Jerusalem do that. Each community should continue following its own custom. According to all the customs and communities where Birkat Kohenim is recited daily, the Kohenim recited at Mincha and Tisha B'Av. And the congregation prays Mincha in the late afternoon. Okay, on Tisha B'Av we pray like mourners do, patiently in a soft voice, without elaborate melodies. It's not really a happy time. Other customs, let's keep going, page 211. Okay? Understood so far? We remove the curtain from the synagogue's ark prior to Mariv. As it says, the Lord has done what he purposed, carried out the decree, pizza imrato. Using a play on words, the sages interpret the, word, the phrase pizza imrato to mean that God, as it were, tore his garment. Imra can mean the hem of a garment or the decree. So the play on words, they said, this expresses the depths to which we have sunk since the temple was destroyed. We only return the curtain to its proper place before Mincha. Many of the custom not to wear a talit or tefillin at shacharit. Just as God, as it were, tore his garment, we too refrain from wearing a talit. Just as the verse states, he is cast down from heaven to earth, the majesty of Israel, which refers to God's tefillin. So too we refrain from crowning ourselves with, with tefillin, However, since most Rishonim maintain that the mitzvah of wearing tefillin applies on Tisha B'Av as it does on all other days, we wear talit and tefillin when? Mincha. Only at Mincha. We refrain from those mitzvot at Shacharit because that is when the mourning and pain reach their peak with the recitation of Kinot. By the time we pray Mincha, however, we can already accept some consolation. Shulchan Aruch rules that we follow this practice in all Ashkenazic communities as well as many Sephardic communities Follow it. What does it say on the notice board upstairs? In Machon Meir? It says on the notice board, Tisha B'Av is coming. Shachrit is at 7.30. And it says, in this place, our custom is to not wear talit and filin in Shacharit. Only in Mincha. Why do some people uh, do it? Because uh, really it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to do it. Uh, it's very strange that you can push off a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah from the Torah to wear your talit and tefillin. It's a, it's a little bit of a... The question is on the communities who don't. <laughs> Not on those who do. Those who do are doing the, the regular routine, fulfillment of the mitzvah, the way it should be done. It's a very innova- big innovation, which got very accepted, that we push off the mitzvah till the afternoon. In order to express our mourning, we shouldn't be you know, wearing our majesty at the peak of our pain when we're reciting the keynote. And that after the mincha, we, we relax and we, we have to fulfill the mitzvah. As we said, we don't push it off totally. Okay. Some, I look at the last paragraph on page 212. Some are careful. Wait. 212, yes. <clears throat> Okay, I, I was going to skip it, but I, I can answer it. He says, one should wear his talit katam from the beginning of the day as usual. Since it is uncertain when one should recite a bracha when putting on a tzitzit in the morning of Tisha B'Av, it's preferable to sleep in one's tzitzit on the night of Tisha B'Av. This way, one will not be obligated to recite the bracha in the morning. Only before mincha should one recite the bracha, wrapping himself in his talit. I think that uh, there are other opinions that you recite the bracha on, on a talit katan as well. This is a little bit of a chumrah. Stringency of the Rav Milambe. It's, it's a little confusing, yeah. On one side we, uh, we take the talit katan, we then say the talacha, but when we are going for the shalit to the shum, we don't have our talit, we don't have to bring, so... <laughs> it's right. strange. The talit katan is underneath our clothes, and so it's not as an outward expression like the talit gadol is. 
But you see the tzitzit. You could see them. That's so, that's the mitzvah. But uh, it's it's not a, a prohibition. Again, this is a custom, custom that in public to wear the talit and tefillin. That's more like, you know, uh, putting on your public yeah, costume. Okay, okay. Okay. Whereas the talit, that's your personal clothing. Everybody wears their personal clothing, and the tzitzit is part of it. Okay. He's just discussing here. What about the bracha? Most days, I don't recite a bracha when I put on my talit katan. Because I know I'm going to put on, you do. Because I know I'm going to put on my talit gadol. But I think when I say the talit bracha on the talit gadol, that I'm covering also my talit katan. That's the uh, standard approach. Okay. There can be other opinions. But, uh, anyways, if you do that, on Tisha B'Av you're in trouble. So I'll be wearing my tzitzit all day long with no bracha. Until... Mincha time, when I put on my Tadit Gado. It's not the end of the world, but to avoid that strange circumstance, he suggests that you sleep with your tzitzit on. Does anybody here sleep with their tzitzit on? Yafeh, okay. I had a friend once who wore his tzitzit at night. I asked him why. We were 16 years old, I don't know. He was very religious. And uh, so was I, but this I'd never seen. I guess we went on a class trip or something, and I saw him wearing his tzitzit that night. I'd never seen that before. So I asked him, what's going on? He said, well, I was taught that when are you obligated to, when can you fulfill the mitzvah of tzitzit? In the daytime. So as soon as the sun rises, I get up at 8 o'clock, but the sun rises at 6 o'clock. Why should I be two hours without fulfilling a mitzvah? So if I go to sleep with my tzitzit on, I'll be wearing it from the moment. It's a unique custom. I don't know that, uh, I think most Jews don't do that. You don't have to wear the tzitzit all, uh, you know, hours of the day. If you, you can fulfill it, if you put them on during the daytime, not at nighttime, but during the daytime. Those, that's their window of opportunity, but nobody ever said that you have to have every moment of that window that you, you're wearing the tzitzit. But very pious people want to go the extra mile. There are also people sleeping with the kippah. That's right. That's right. Even though there's no real uh, obligation to wear a kippah. Now there's, it's the custom, so that obligates you. But um, yeah, they say, I don't want to be, right? The kippah is this, this designed so that we have the fear of God. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be without the fear of God at any moment. Mm -hmm. I even know some people that don't wear a kippah all day long because they don't want to be looked at funny or they don't want people to uh, brand them, label them as, oh, you're one of those religious fanatics. But they do wear the tzitzit <laughs> all day long. It's a mitzvah. They believe in God. They want to keep the mitzvot. But the kippah is such a social marker, it's a stigma, that they, that's, that's hard for them. It's improper, it's not right, but um, it makes some logic in terms of the actual obligation. Tzitzit is mentioned in the Torah, the kippah. Everybody jokes. Where does it say that you have to wear your hat? That you have to wear a hat? Right? In some communities, you have to wear a black hat if you're a good Jew. Not only a kippah, but on top of it, you wear a fedora. How do we know that Yaakov Avinu wore a black hat? Well, it says in the Torah, Yaakov Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva. Yaakov went out from where he was living. He went out from Be'er Sheva, and he walked to Haran. Do you think Yaakov would go out without a hat? Something on his own. No, it must have been a black fedora. Good morning. Yes. Who's they? I'm gonna myself. I'm gonna. I'm gonna head home to shave. If you could let me know if it's kosher or not, I'm gonna do it either way. No problem, David. If I can, if not, do it. Just take a Do not, do not, do not, do not. I do not condone that. If you're asking me. So then ask me, so you have to listen to me. Don't ask me and then do something that I disagree with. I know, but we don't have time. I'm, I, it's, just, it's killing me. I'm sorry. I'll see you tomorrow. I, I'll, be, I'll be in touch with you when I finish class. I'm in the middle of class right now. I'll, I'll be... Oh. Okay. Okay. I am uh, so sorry that he feels so... Uh,
upset. He's so, uh, so he must be in a t- terrible pain. I feel sorry. I'll have to try to answer him soon. Okay. In any case, we were talking about wearing, the, wearing a hat. Yeah. Wearing a hat. Yeah. So it's a joke. It's a joke. Obviously, it doesn't say in the Torah that he wore a hat, but he says he went out. Can you imagine going Yaakov Avinu going out without a hat? Of course, it's anachronistic. It's a, it's a joke because uh, you know nobody wore fedoras till the uh, 19th century. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, obviously, the Jewish dress has changed with the societies that we're in, uh, so it's very hard to to attach tremendous significance to, uh, you know, this type of dress, this, this uh, <coughs> style of clothing. Of course, and Jews live in a certain place in a, for a long time, the community takes upon itself certain practices. And if you're joining that community, so then you don't want to keep those practices. That, it's a nice, it's a good social marker. But uh, now we live in an in-gathering of exiles. We have Jews from all over. But we need to be careful, uh, especially in some countries in Europe, to wear kippahs could be very dangerous. Oh yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's anti-Semitism, and yeah, you don't need to risk your life. Uh, don't put need to put your life at risk for for this, uh, you know, social marker. The tzitzit is a netfilin. That's already mitzvot from the Torah. You must keep. You can keep them in public and private. You don't have to uh, ask for trouble. But anyways, on, um, we wear the talit and the tefillin at mincha time on Tisha B'Av. Okay, let's, uh, one more section about the prayers, and then we're going to open up the keynote books. Did anybody take any of these from the library yesterday? Yeah. yeah. No. Do you have it here? We can borrow for Tisha B'Av. On Tisha B'Av you can borrow, but I want to use them for class. I'm quite upset that everybody took them yesterday. Did everybody have permission? I don't know then. We need that. I wanted to show you some of the keynote. Now I only have two copies. But um, if anybody else has one in their room, now's the time to go get it. But, uh, anyways, we'll get to the keynote in just a minute. I'll show you the keynote books as best as I can without the uh, other copies. But uh, it says on page 213. Ariel, how are you doing? Good. Are you ready to read for us? Always ready to read. That's great. <laughs> Terrific. Excellent. Page 213 at the top of the page. Four verses in the prayers and in the bracha, bracha of Shezab. We're not allowed to study Torah. Many of the prayers have Torah study. It's part of them. Another part is we thank Hashem for giving us shoes. Tisha B'Av, we're not wearing shoes. So let's see what we do about that. Go ahead. Most of the passages. Most of the passages recited in the Karbanot section were included in the regular prayer service for two reasons. One, to substitute for the actual offerings and as a preparation for a prayer. And two, so that every Jew studies a bit of Torah each day for scripture. Mishnah and Talmud. Consequently, on Tisha B'Av, when one may not study Torah, the question arises. May one recite these passages? Many folks can maintain that the main purpose of any part of our liturgy is simply to serve as prayer. Therefore, one may recite any liturgical passages of the Shabbat. Sephardim, as well as some Ashkenazim, follow this viewpoint in practice. Others maintain that on the Shabbat, one may recite only what he recites on a regular basis in his prayer. He should not, however, recite passages that he does not actually recite in Okay. The standard is we, we say everything we usually do. Because it's not said as study of Torah, but it's said as part of the prayer service. And therefore, it's allowed. Okay, go ahead. Some people recite several chapters of the Tehidim every day, such that they complete the entire book of Torah. Some maintain that one may recite these daily chapters on Shabbat after midday. Others maintain that it is better to postpone reciting these chapters until after the Shabbat. One of the morning blessings is the Rakha of Shesa Ikor Tzokin, which expresses gratitude to God for providing us with shoes to wear. 
even though one may not wear high quality shoes on Shabbat and Yom Kippur, Akhenazim and some Sephardim recite the bracha. Because it is a general expression of thanksgiving for the normal way of the world, not for the shoes one wears on it for any particular day. Moreover, one may wear low quality shoes on these days. Furthermore, we put on regular shoes after the fast is over, and some said that the Berkat Hashachar applies to the night as well. According to Azah, however, one should not recite the Bracha on these days. And most of the follow this position. So there is your one difference of the regular prayer service. Is this bracha of Asadi Kortsoki is omitted by some Sephardim. Most Sephardim, he says here, whereas I think most Ashkenazim say, you're allowed to say the bracha. It's a general expression of thanksgiving. It's not for you specifically wearing the shoes. Okay? All right. Now, where the big difference is, after, of course, uh, you know, there's a special tour in the, in the Shachrit service, then we have... We have the keynote. Now the keynote, as you can see here, here is uh, uh, one, one uh, we don't have enough for everybody to look at. This is the same thing. It just has a nice slip cover. I'll take it off. As you can see, it's the same book. This is an English copy of the keynote. And here's another copy. As you can see, the art scroll. They also put out, it's an entire book for the day of Tisha B'Av. They start off with Eicha. For, for the night of Tisha B'Av, Erev Tisha B'Av, Erev Tisha B'Av, that, um, of course, we read the Eicha, so you can, it has Arvit, you can follow along. If it's a Sephardi version, then you'll have the Anenu and the Nachem, as we spoke about earlier. And then Megillat Eicha, five chapters with English in these editions. And then after the Eicha, there's Kinot. Kinot, and that's really the majority of the book as you can see, Eicha is uh, very short. It's only five chapters. Afterwards, we have these uh, lamentations, they're called. The book of Eicha is translated as lamentations, and Kinot is translated as lamentations. I don't really have a, a better word for you. The Kinot, mm -hmm. I call them, what does it say here? They don't give a translation. It's called here, the Tisha B'Av service. <laughs> but it doesn't have doesn't have a, a different word for... Uh, it's a poem that, uh, this is the beginning of keynote, and then there's a list, as you can see, there's a list of how many? There must be uh, 50 keynote. Uh, five, we say, kinos, kinos. So you can see there uh, a list, here's a, here's a list, 46 keynote. If you look at the table of contents here, there's five in the nighttime, and from 6 through 46 in the daytime. Each one here has a, 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 uh, the text. Of course, they actually, in this book, they put in the Shacharit service too. You should have one book. It's like a machzor for the entire day of Yom Kippur. You have a, one book for the entire day of Tisha B'Av. But really, you can pray out of your regular shidur. That's right. Those are the keynote for Tisha, for the night of Tisha B'Av. That's right. But um, if you look in the table of contents, you see that there's five at night, and then another four, six to 46 is another 40 for the daytime. Each one is a beautiful poem that describes the destruction from a different vantage point, from a different angle. Some talk about, what would you talk about if you're going to write a poem about the destruction of the temple, about Tisha B'Av? What angles can you think of? Okay, I'm here giving you the uh, pain the pain the of details. yeah. So what what do you mean the pain? What the Romans did to us? Like, if, like why the being destroyed? Why? Good. Number one, why the temple's being destroyed? A lot of poems that talk about why the temple's being destroyed. What our sins were? Sinachina, other sins that the Jewish people. What else? What else would you write in your poem for Tisha B'av? How it was destroyed? Excellent, for sure. There was this chamber, there was these vessels, there was this fire, this was this, this, you know, um, uh, maybe uh, weapons that were used. Yeah, a lot, a long, a lot of detail about the the uh, destruction itself. What else? 
So if you, if I, if you make a poem portion of it, you mean? That would, that's yeah, what would you put in there about Tisha B'Av? Which time? On for Tisha B'Av, if you wrote a poem for Tisha B'Av, what would you talk about? What's the t- content? Which hour? What do you mean, which hour? Like when the destroying begins. Oh, when exactly it happened. Good, okay. Yeah, there's some detail about when precisely it happened. What did you want to say? I will say, how do I can bring a korban now? <coughs> Yafeh, we, we, we cry about everything that we're missing about the temple experience. What it was like to come. I cannot bring a, a sacrifice anymore. I cannot get atonement for my sins. Good. What did you want to think? What to do with the people? They, they are there. Excellent. Excellent. People don't realize. You think we're mourning for the building? When the Jerusalem was destroyed, they destroyed the population too. They killed men, women, and children. There was the Jewish people that were exiled. And not only do we mention the exile of Judea, we remember back there was 150 years before that, the exile of the ten tribes. The majority of the people of Israel were exiled. So we talk about what it's like to go into exile. We talk about, the poems speak about what it's like to have, what, what led up to the destruction. We talked about the siege around Jerusalem, right? What happens when you're in siege? Then you have no food. No food. Everything's cut off. Everything's cut off. People were starving in the streets. So there's poems describing the starvation, describing the, the horrible conditions in Jerusalem that was under siege. There's poems describing from every angle. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah? That's what these 40 poems are about. Each one we recite while sitting on the floor. After the Shachrit service, we, we, we go through one after, some of them are responsive. The community says one line, the Chazan says the other line. Sometimes in my community, you know what they do? They go around the room and they ask every individual to lead one of the 40 poems. That way, you get, it keeps you involved. And then you hear different voices. It doesn't have to be one chazan who's reciting all of them. Okay? So you could have different people. Then there's responses. Some of them even have a tune. I was going to show you the most famous one, but maybe tomorrow I'll show it to you, and we'll, I'll teach it to you. Okay? How to sing the most famous one in the Ashkenazi community. It's such a famous tune. Um, and, and tomorrow is also Thursday. Some people sing the same tune to the Zmirot Shabbat. Some of the Zmirot Shabbat. I'll make sure that we have enough copies for tomorrow. If the copies don't find their way back to us, I'll photocopy at least one of the keynote to teach you. But then I want to tell you that there's something else added in. And some of them are in the book and some are not in the book. And you go to most synagogues around the country, around the world, on Tisha B'Av, you'll see these types of books. Sometimes they're smaller, they're like booklets. That's when it's only in Hebrew. It can be smaller, but when it's translated, you need bigger print. <laughs> Some communities, almost all communities, have additional. Additional poems that they print up on pages or booklets, and they give out to everybody. Why are there additional ones? What else do we mourn for on Tisha B'Av? For the, the exile of the Shekhinah. Exile of the Shekhinah, good. But that's associated with the temple being destroyed and leaving Jerusalem. Today, uh, the, the day of Tisha B'Av is the national day of mourning. Of anything. Of anything. What else yeah, yeah, happened to the Jewish I, people? I the Holocaust, the Holocaust. The good. What else? They, um, they that's right, the Inquisition, good. What other things? World Major events. Movie. Sure. The truth is there's not so much about World War I, but um, there should be. But there are keynote about the Holocaust mm-hmm. that some people print and, and they, they add it to, they, they give them out in the synagogue. Already we're following a tradition because in this book, it doesn't only have poems about Jerusalem from all those angles which we were describing, the people, the, the, uh, the destruction itself, the, the, uh, the siege. 
also there's a poem about the burning of the Talmud in the 13th century in Germany. They put it on trial. That's right. The Talmud was burnt, and this was a major blow to the German communities. The poem was written by one of our greatest scholars of history, the Maharam from Rottenburg. It's in the book already. You don't need extra copies. Our tradition is to add poems about other events. One more major event, which you should know about. We mentioned it. One second. We mentioned it not too long ago. The Khmelnytsky massacres in the Ukraine in years 1648 and 1649. The 17th century, hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed. Per capita, it's more than the Holocaust. There were 6 million Jews out of 13 million killed, approximately. In the Khmelnytsky massacres, there were not so many Jews in the world. And the hundreds of thousands that were killed in Ukraine were more than the equivalent of 6 million. Horrible thing, so we have a poem commemorating the destruction of the massacres that happened in the Ukraine. And on that theme, so we have additional, you know what's, uh, what else happened in recent history? You mentioned the Holocaust. Some people add in a kina, right? The singular of kinot is kina. Mm -hmm. Le Konen is, is, is a, a sad poem. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, Kamat. Some people have composed a kina about the destruction of the communities in Aza, in Gush Katif. And in the north of the Shomron, there were two communities destroyed there too. In very recent history, this is a destruction of communities. It's not exactly the same because the people were not tortured and they were not massacred and killed. It's of a different kind, but still it's a national tragedy that uh, communities in the land of Israel were destroyed. If we're gonna talk about, who is here? Uh, David Adler, is for, where is he from in Germany? Yes, Frankfurt. Nope. Where is he from? Russia. No. It's Speyer, Speyer, exactly from Speyer. There is a kina in the book here. I show you. I was going to show you, but it's about the destruction of the communities of Speyer's worms and mines. Those are the three main Ashkenazi, the three main Ashkenazi communities. Ashkenazi. Yeah, yeah. They're called in Rashi Tivot Shum, Shin is for Speyer, Vav is for worms or worms. And mem is for mines, or magenza, the way they used to pronounce it, or the way we pronounce it sometimes today. So they're known as kihilot shum, the communities of shum. This was a major blow to the Jewish people. Which year? The year is, I think, the first crusade. So it's 1096. 1096, if I'm not mistaken, or, or, or close near there. 800 years ago, 900 years ago. It all gets added into the book of Kinot. This is the national day of mourning of the, all the bad things that happened to us throughout our <coughs> exile. Does it, have, uh, does it include the Spanish Inquisition? So yeah, I think that uh, it does mention the, the uh, torture. Uh, maybe more in the, in the Sephardic uh, uh, communities. Mm -hmm. um, every community, you know, wrote their lament for the, the destruction that they experienced. But uh, so this is, um, we sit on the floor after Shacharit, we read from the Torah, we close the Torah, we put it back in the Aaron Kodesh, and then everybody goes back and sits again on a low stool or the floor until, and then we start, we start reciting kina after kina after kina after kina. 40 kinot, to tell you the truth, many communities. 41. 41. In many communities, they find it's too much. People start to fall asleep. People start to leave. Because it's hard for us to be sad. Some of them are, everybody's reading it in Hebrew. They don't really understand the Hebrew because poetry is even hard. Even if you're a Hebrew speaker, poetry is hard for you. And so some communities, they take the short cut.
<laughs> and they skip. Mutar. Is it mutar? Yes. That's why many rabbis of their communities, everybody has to make the call what is appropriate for their community. If people are just going to be leaving, so then you, you pick the most important keynote, the most powerful poems, piyutim, and you recite them only. And maybe in some communities they even explain what they're about. So you have somebody... Before they start reading the kina, they'll explain this one is about this, uh, the Talmud that was burned. This one is about the Kohanim. Nobody mentioned that before. Can you see the perspective of the destruction from the perspective of the Kohanim? Who, that was their life. They were living there. They were, they were, this was their, their sole primary purpose, is to serve in the temple. Now they, they have no, their whole structure of their, of their of cycle of their years destroyed so many perspectives. Anyways, there are a number of keynote, many communities do skip some, and you'll see, get a page they give out so that you can follow along which ones we say, which ones we skip. Now we're going to go ahead 10 pages, now we're going to go ahead another 5 pages and recite this one and that one, and so you have page numbers with the specific uh, keynote which are said in each community. Is that clear? Are there questions about this? Uh, you understand what it's going to look like? So the history always coming, it's coming back. Because when mm. we at that time, mm. uh, we talk about the Shabbat. It's exactly that's what we're afraid of, of course. We, we, that's the, 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 we can't forget that the goal of Tisha B'Av is to do tshuva, to repent, to fix our ways so that it doesn't happen again. Right? We want, we're praying for the redemption, but we realize that we have a part to play. And uh, we should be thinking about that. After we finish the keynote, perhaps, what do we do the rest of the day? We can read other poems about Jerusalem. We can study some portions of Torah. Also spend our time trying to fix our own bidot, trying to fix, try to think, what can we do different so that Musar, that's right, what can we do different so that these types of calamities will not happen again? Maybe there are things we need to fix personally. Maybe there are things we need to fix nationally. But all of it is part of the tshuva that we do on Tisha B'Av. We mourn, we pray, we, we beg Hashem, and we connect to the calamities, and we also uh, try to do what we can to take the time to, to fix what needs fixing. Go to the corporal. Some people go to the Kotel. You definitely, uh, your prayers might uh, be more powerful there and to see the destruction with your own eyes. Very powerful, yeah. All right. Bezrat Hashem, tomorrow I'll teach you the songs. And. What are the prayers? What do you mean, the prayers? We just descri- we described them. We said Shachrit's a normal Shachrit service. Except you're sitting on the floor. <laughs> we mentioned <laughs> what's the bracha? Shasali kol turki. Some Sephardim skip it. Other than that, it's normal. We don't say tachnun. We do have a Torah reading, a special Torah reading, and then we say the kinot. That we discussed. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. Unless you were busy taking notes on the previous. Uh, and then like in most fast days. There's, there's a Torah reading, and there's um, yeah, a Haftarah. It's not a specific order of all this one. It's in your Siddur. It's in your Siddur. It's, it's the same as what, we, what you saw on, on Mincha of Shiva Sarba Tammuz. Same thing on the Mincha of Tisha B'Av. Only for Tisha B'Av. Yeah, one book, though, only for one day. Only one day. Yeah, one day, the whole book, right. Yeah. All right, we'll stop here for today. Bezad Hashem, tomorrow... The truth is, tomorrow is the last day of classes if, uh, until the three weeks uh, break. So maybe we'll have some a little bit of a send off. Let's do it. Everybody, bring something in, some sweets. No, no, no meat or wine. Beer is okay if you want at nine in the morning. You want to have beer? Okay, you might have a problem there. Uga, ugiot. Everybody, try to bring something in. Maybe some fruits. 
Okay, everybody, if you can, you don't have to. Uh, I'll bring something. Ariel's going to bring drinks. On Shabbat? Regular. No, not this year. This year, as many as you want. Many foods, even on Sudash Lishit. I know, but Shabbat, the Shabbat meals are a mitzvah to celebrate. Overrides the usual uh, practice for Tisha B'Av. This year only. Okay?